Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on experimental techniques in which we're discussing the Human Genome Project. Now, um, so far, we've discussed genome libraries, and then we've discussed the Sanger sequencing method, which are the techniques which were actually used to uh, sequence the human genome in the Human Genome Project. Now, it took ages. It, to do what I have described, it took them 13 years and cost three billion pounds. Now, basically, uh, we can now sequence human genomes for under $10,000. Uh, sorry, three billion dollars is how much the Human Genome Project um, cost. We can now sequence um, human uh, genomes for under $10,000, and it's fast approaching $1,000. Um, so you might think, well, what a waste of money. They should have waited until 2014 to sequence the human genome. But of course, the reality is that they spent three billion pounds so that we could develop these new technologies. If the Human Genome Project had not happened, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't now have the technology that allows us to sequence a human genome for nearly $1,000. Okay, uh, so uh, what we're now going to do is see how human genomes are sequenced nowadays, and in fact how uh, the genomes of loads of different organisms are being sequenced. We're sequencing the genomes of all sorts of organisms now, anything we can lay our hands on pretty much. We're sequencing the genomes of different people in the population, we are sequencing the uh, genomes of different cells in people, and specifically in tumours where you have intratumor heterogeneity, it's a big area of study there. Okay, so we are sequencing the genomes of loads of different things. Now, how are we doing it, basically? Well, we are using a technique known as next-generation sequencing. Okay, and that's the topic for this video. We are going to talk about this next-generation sequencing, which has replaced the need for Sanger sequencing, basically. Next-generation sequencing. And I want to stress it's... It's still a modified, it's a, just a modified form of Sanger sequencing. It's not something totally different. It's not like we've suddenly moved to doing mass spec and we're fragmenting it up and using mass spec. We're still using terminator nucleotides, uh, which are fluorescently labelled, but there's a big difference between next generation sequencing and the original Sanger method. Now, next generation sequencing is often abbreviated to N. So if you hear people talking about NGS, they're talking about next generation sequencing. Right, okay, so the task is still the same. To sequence the DNA on the chromosome 1, 2, all the way up to 23, which we're assuming is X for the purposes of this um, talk. Okay, right. Uh, so, again, next generation sequencing cannot sequence an entire chromosome. You know, some of them are over 100 billion base pairs, sorry, not 100 billion, that would be quite a massive chromosome, 100 million base pairs, some of them. Uh, so, uh, you cannot sequence one of those all in one go. So instead, you still have to fragment up your genome, and you have to produce lots of different fragments. So again, what you do is you take your 23 chromosomes, so let's have chromosome 1, 2, all the way up to chromosome 23, and you take multiple copies of them, and again, you're going to fragment these, um, these multiple copies up into um, different pieces, basically. So you're going to use a partial uh, restriction digest in order to um, in order to get loads of different possible fragments, basically. So let me just re-go over what a partial restriction digest is, because I would like this video to stand alone, and you not need to watch my um, previous videos on genome libraries and um, the Sanger method in order to understand it. So, basically, if we draw out our chromosome 1 here, okay, right, here's our chromosome 1, uh, then we know we can't sequence this entire chromosome all in one go. So instead what we're going to do is we're going to chop it up using restriction endonucleases. So let's say these little things that I'm drawing here represent restriction recognition sites on the uh, chromosome 1. So these represent places along chromosome 1 where this restriction endonuclease can cut, basically. Okay, now, 
If you were to put a very high concentration of restriction endonucleases onto this chromosome 1, what would happen is that the restriction endonucleases would cut at every single one of these restriction sites. So you'd get loads of different frag... well, basically you'd cut at every different site. So you'd get a fragment here, 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 and a fragment here. So basically, that corresponds to cutting at all these different sites, like so. Okay? Right. Okay, so you cut the chromosome up in loads of different places and get these, um, these fragments, basically. Now, that's what's known as a full restriction digest, when you actually cut the chromosome at every single one of its restriction sites, basically. So that's a full restriction digest. Okay, so these here are restriction sites that I've marked in blue, and that just means where the restriction enzyme will recognize and then cut. So restriction sites, or recognition sites, if you want to call them that. All right, so um, what you can then do is you could then sequence all of these fragments, but there's a problem. How do you then put them back together? How do you know which fragment comes in which order? How do you know if you if you know if you've cut up all uh, the chromosomes from one to twenty three? How do you know which chromosome it's even on anymore? You don't is the answer. So you don't do this. You can't piece it back together afterwards if you do this. So instead, what you do is what's known as partial restriction digest. So you get multiple chromosome ones, and basically you put a lower concentration of um, restriction endonuclease on. And this means now that the restriction endonuclease is no longer cut at every site, basically. So if I recopy out our chromosome 1 here, maybe this time uh, some of these restriction sites will not get cut anymore. Okay, so here again are these restriction sites. But this time, let's say we don't have a, put a high enough concentration of restriction uh, endonuclease in to cut at every single site. So let's say instead it only cuts here and here. Then, basically, it will fall into um, three different fragments. One here, then another one here, okay, and finally another one here. Okay, so it will be cut into three fragments, but it's not cut anymore at every restriction site. Now you might ask, well, what use is that? Uh, you'll, you can still sequence these fragments, they're slightly longer, but potentially you can still sequence them. Uh, but um, you're still no better off than you were up here, you're not going to be able to piece them back together. Well, this is why it's important that you have multiple uh, chromosome ones. Because if you have multiple copies of this chromosome, then on different chromosome ones, you're going to get uh, the restriction enzymes cutting a different selection of the restriction sites, basically. So if I take another chromosome one here, maybe in this chromosome one, instead of cutting those blue, uh, these blue lines here, instead you cut at these pink lines, maybe like that. So you cut. The, at these two restriction sites, okay? So in that case, what you'll get is this tiny little fragment up here, and then you'll get the fragment between these two pink lines, which is this middle fragment here, with a restriction site in the middle there. Whoops, I've slipped this a bit. Okay, and then you'll get this fragment at the bottom here, which has two, um, two restriction sites in it. So one restriction site here, and one down here. Okay, right. Now, why is this better? Well, if you sequence all of these fragments and you get the genetic sequence for all of them, oh, look at this. You can now, I claim you can, rebuild the sequence of the entire chromosome. Why? Because if you think about what the sequence of this fragment is going to be, and then look at the sequence of this fragment, so look at these two fragments here. They have an overlap, is the important bit. Look, this bit is shared between them. So, 
On the end of this one, you will get a great big sequence of organic bases, which will be identical to the great big sequence of organic bases here. So you can say, you know, if this is, if this is I don't know, 30 organic bases long, the chance that the two of them will just happen to have that identical sequence and not be overlapping is quite small. So what you can say is this one and this one must overlap, basically, that this one must be followed by this one. So you can then put the sequence from this one together with the sequence from this one. And then overall now, you've, not, you've got a bigger sequence. You've got the sequence of this entire length here now. Okay, so by putting them together in that way. Now, again, the same thing is true with this sequence here, this fragment here, and this fragment here now. So let me get another colour so I can highlight this. So this fragment here in orange has a considerable portion which overlaps with this fragment here. Okay, so again, maybe this is 40 or 50 organic bases. So Again, you can say, okay, they could have occurred and not be related at all, but it's very likely that they overlap. So we'll say these overlap with one another, and then you can extend your sequence because now you know what all of these bits following this portion is. So you can now say you know the sequence of this portion, and then you can continue on and build up uh, the whole of the sequence for chromosome uh, 1, basically. Okay, so this concept of uh, putting uh, the different fragments together is known as restriction mapping, basically. Okay, so restriction mapping. Right, uh, so uh, now, now I've explained to you the advantage of doing a partial restriction digest on multiple copies of chromosome 1, and then that allowing you to piece the, um, piece the fragments back together, basically. Let's talk about how we uh, actually sequence these fragments, basically, that we've got out of our partial restriction uh, digest. Because at the moment, this is exactly what they did in the Human Genome Project. What changes now is how you sequence the fragments. So basically, what they do is they f produce all of these fragments, and then they put them onto something known as a flow cell. Well, they're not going to put them all on one flow cell, but they're going to put a huge number of these different fragments onto a flow cell. Okay, so you'll get a flow cell, and I need to explain to you what a flow cell is. Okay, so a flow cell, whoops, a flow cell is basically a glass plate. So this is a flow cell. And what you're going to do is attach your DNA fragments onto this flow cell. Now, you can't directly attach them. In order to attach your DNA fragments, let's say we've got here a little DNA fragment, what you have to do is you have to put a special portion of DNA, you have to attach a special portion of DNA to the bottom of your DNA fragment called an adapter protein. Uh, well, not an adapter protein, an adapter piece of DNA. So this is the adapter piece of DNA. So, what you do is you take your genome, uh, you fragment it up in a partial restriction, restriction digest, sorry. You take all the fragments and you stick on this adapter region at the bottom of those fragments. Okay, then you put another important region, which we're going to see why it's important in a moment. And this is going to be important for stick producing a primer too, so we'll call this the primer region. Okay. And uh, we will um, color the primer region in red. OK, so here's the primer region in red. Now, what's going to happen is we're going to put these fragments now all on this flow cell. And the purpose of the adapter region is that it will attach onto the flow cell. So what's going to happen is you're going to get the adapter region sticking onto the flow cell. And you're going to get your piece of DNA pointing up like this. Okay, so here's our primer region vertically sticking out. Here's our adapter region now attached onto the flow cell, which effectively you can just think of the flow cell as a glass plate. Okay, so flow cell slash glass plate. Okay, so 
what's going to happen is that you're going to have every single fragment, well, maybe not every one, uh, but you're going to have a lot of different fragments that you're all going to sequence at once on this flow cell. So here's another fragment here with this same adapter region and the same primer region here. Okay, so I'll put this on here. Okay. Oops, okay, uh, and there's the adapter region. So you will have all these different uh, um, all these different fragments with their adapter regions and their primer regions attached onto them at either end, and they will be sticking onto this flow cell, and we'll continue this discussion in the next video.